Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on preparing for engineering professional review through CIHT. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Greg Saunders, and I'm the Education and Qualifications Officer here at CIHT. I'm delighted to be joined today by Gordon Gray, Technical Director at SWECO, and Laurie Robinson, Principal Engineer at WSP. I'm also joined today by my colleague Kat Gumel, who's CIHT's Head of Education and Professional Development. Uh, Kat will be helping me collate and respond to questions during the webinar. Once the presentations have finished, we will be holding a live Q&A session. So please do enter any questions you might have um, in the questions tab of your GoToWebinar toolbar. Um, both Kat and myself will try to respond to some of these during the webinar, whilst leaving others to be responded to by Gordon and Laurie at the end. And what I would say is please do try and keep your questions as broad and as general as possible as we might not be able to answer very specific questions on certain individual projects. So for those of you who may not be aware, CIHT is a charity, learning society and professional membership body. And we're the leading voice of the highways and transportation infrastructure profession in the UK and globally. We've got just around um, 14,000 members in total who work in the private, public and academic sectors. So essentially, we like to think of ourselves as being a natural home for everyone and everybody who works in the highways and transportation infrastructure. And very relevant to today's webinar, we are licensed by the Engineering Council to assess our members against the relevant standards for CENG, ING and ENGTEC registration. So obviously, we're all here today to learn a little bit more about professional review, but what actually is a professional review? Um, it's probably best uh, explains by breaking it down into three different parts. The first part is the submission of a portfolio of evidence via our online application portal. There's then a pre-interview assessment which takes place uh, to determine your eligibility to proceed to a professional review interview. Um, so just to make that clear, an interview isn't necessarily guaranteed just by virtue of making an application. Um, but if you are eligible to proceed, you will then be invited to attend a professional review interview as the final stage of the process. Now, the UK spec document, which hopefully a lot of you are familiar with, um, this describes the competence and the commitment requirements which must be met for registration at CENG, ING and ENGTEC level. It really is essential that you seek to familiarise yourself with this document before you apply and refer to it continuously during your application as well. Now, Gordon will be discussing the UK spec requirements in further detail shortly, but just to let you know, you can download a copy of the latest version um, of UK spec, which is the fourth edition, either via our own website or via the Engineering Council's website. So let's take a look if you're eligible to apply for professional review. Now you must have received confirmation from CIHT that you're eligible to make a professional review application. And this will either be in the form of an initial assessment outcome email or a technical report or further learning report successful outcome letter if you've applied via the individual route. But please be aware that you must be a CIHT member at the appropriate grades in order to apply. Um, but as a little side note, we do have affiliate arrangements uh, for members of the Institute of Asphalt Technology, as well as the Institute of Quarrying. But in all other cases, you would need to be a member at the appropriate grade. OK, so submitting your portfolio of evidence, how do you go about it? Well, the application process has now moved online. Uh, as I said, we've got an online application portal for CENG, ING and ENGTEC applicants. Um, you would be required to upload confirmation of your eligibility in order to unlock the full application form. So one of the two methods which I've just referred to in the previous slide. The great thing about our online application portal is that you can log in and save it as you go. Um, so it doesn't need to be completed all in one session. You can update your evidence whenever you've got some free time to do so. For each section, of the online application system and we've got helpful instructions to guide you and, and to offer you prompts on how to complete each section. Once all sections have been completed you will have an opportunity to preview a draft copy of your submission just to see what it looks like before you submit and you've got an opportunity to do that as many times as you wish to ensure that you're happy with the final version before clicking submit. 
Just to let you know as well that the professional review assessment fee is also made via the online portal. And once the assessment fee is being paid, the system will provide you with a PDF copy of your application. And this is the copy which will be sent to your reviewers. Once all of that's been done, the education team will then contact you with information on the next steps about a potential interview if you're eligible to proceed. Now I'd like to quickly just draw your attention to some resources which you might find helpful in making your application. The first is our specialisms document and this covers eight specialisms that relate to different occupational areas of the industry as listed on your screen. As part of the professional review application you will be asked to declare your specialism so please do take the time to read this document carefully and you can choose more than one specialism if applicable. But this really is an important part of the assessment process um, because this impacts the reviewers which are allocated to your submission. And as you may be aware, at least one of your reviewers will have the same specialism which you've declared. Um, so you can be sure that um, you're being reviewed by experts who truly understand the nature of your work. And so very important, please don't just skim over this. Please do take the time to read this document. Here's a snapshot of what the specialisms document looks like. Um, so for instance, if your specialism is transport planning, you simply need to refer to the transport planning section um, to make sure that your experience does align to this specialism. Uh, but you can also use this document to help you draw upon examples to include within your UK spec evidence forms. So it's multi-purpose in that sense. The next resource which I'd highly recommend is downloading a copy of our experience and evidence tracking tools. Now this template incorporates the examples already provided in the UK spec document and allows you to think about, about examples from your own experience. So you can use the specialisms document which I've just discussed to help populate this template. But primarily it's a great way to also determine how close you might be to making a professional review application. A CIHT Learn. If you're not familiar with CIHT Learn, please do take the time to check it out. It is a fantastic digital learning platform which provides members with access to free and low cost online training, as well as a tool to plan and record your CPD. And it includes a highly recommended preparing for professional review module, which is free to both members and non members. So please do take the time to have a look at that and familiarize yourself with the platform. Um, the professional review module covers a range of aspects but should primarily help you uh, feel comfortable and prepared before you uh, sit a professional review interview. So other resources available, we've got various other resources. Um, the list on your screen isn't exhaustive but just to run through a few. Um, a making an application for professional review uh, video which is a 10 minute video tutorial on how to complete the online application portal. We've got a guidance for academics document, um, an additional guidance document to support academics applying for professional review. So if you are an academic, please uh, do familiarize yourself with this document, it's very helpful. If you're an EngTech candidate, we've got a supplementary EngTech guidance document um, available to download from our website, which is an excellent support tool. Regional support. Now, as a member, you will belong to a CIHT region and as well as providing a programme of high quality CPD events throughout the year, you can contact and get in touch with your region to find out uh, mentoring support opportunities that are available, as well as other events going on um, which can count towards your CPD. Mentoring. We do strongly advise professional review candidates to use a mentor to support them with their application. And if you are struggling to find a mentor internally at your workplace, as I said, you can contact your region or alternatively, please just get in touch with us at the education team uh, and we will try to put you in contact with someone who can help. Now, just finally, I wanted to touch upon another important aspect of professional review applications and that's sponsors. Um, you will need two sponsors who are professionally registered at the level being sought or above. So if you're applying for CNG, both of your sponsors would need to be CNG registrants with the Engineering Council. Just to say that they can be regis 
registered through any professional engineering institution. Um, so they don't need to be registered through CIHT. Um, and they don't even need to be CIHT members. They do just need to be engineering council registrants at an appropriate level. I guess the crucial part about uh, this slide is that your sponsors must review a copy of your portfolio before you submit. Um, and they must also complete a sponsor authentication form, which includes a statement of support um, to indicate in their belief why you meet the UK spec requirements. Now, unlike mentors, unfortunately, we can't help put candidates in touch with sponsors, as leads must be individuals who have worked with you in a professional capacity. So that brings me on to the end of my uh, introductory presentation. Um, just to let you know that further information on our upcoming submission deadlines, interview dates, and all of our fees can be found on our website. Um, so if you've got any queries whatsoever, please do get in touch with us using the email address on your screen. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll hand over now to Gordon. Think you may so be on mute, can, Gordon. Yeah, we can see your slides. Apologies, I'm not overly familiar with the, the webinar system, but uh, yeah, hopefully my slides have came through. Uh, thanks for keeping me right there, Greg, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, I'm Gordon Gray. I'm a fellow with the CIHT and a, a technical director at SWECO. Uh, I'm giving a, a reviewer's perspective of the professional review today. Uh, so just to give you a bit of background on my experience. Uh, just some of the content of what I'm going to present today. So just a little bit in my background, uh, some more details on the UK spec, as Greg just kind of mentioned in his introduction as well, and the importance of that to any professional review application. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the portfolio of evidence, and in particular, what as a reviewer I'd be looking to see from a portfolio. Uh, moving on to your projects, presentations which forms part of your review interview uh, then i'll discuss the review interview itself uh, then i'll finish with just some final considerations and a bit of a summary so just on my background for myself uh, i've got 21 years experience in highways design and project management on major infrastructure schemes uh, mainly from a consultancy background uh, i'm currently a technical director within sweco uk uh, working from their Glasgow office. Uh, I achieved chartered engineer status with the IHT in 20, sorry, 2008, so that's not a typo that it was called the IHT back then, it was that long ago. Uh, I became a reviewer for the CIHT in uh, 2016, and since then I've undertaken over 30 professional reviews, both at IENG and CENG levels. Uh, I'm also a member of the CIHT's Engineering Professional Standards Panel since uh, last year. Uh, now, that panel is the, the panel which actually reviews the whole review process and ratifies any decisions that are made by reviewers. Uh, so I've had a, a, a couple of sessions of that as well in my experience. So a bit more about my background, why did I become a reviewer? Uh, one of the, the main reasons for that was just really an opportunity to give something back to uh, my profession. Uh, it's also personally an, an excellent CPD opportunity for myself. I gain a lot of uh, interesting experience just from actually uh, undertaking reviews and hearing about a lot of very interesting projects from uh, some pretty diverse backgrounds. Uh, it also helped to understand my understanding of the review process uh, as well. Uh, as I've progressed through my career, uh, I've become a mentor to a number of individuals uh, within different companies and within my team. Uh, so by improving my understanding of the review, review process, it actually makes me a better uh, mentor, I believe. Uh, so it allows me to mentor staff more effectively that way. Uh, it's also a very good networking opportunity for myself. I get to meet a lot of individuals, both co-reviewers and candidates as well. And uh, like I say, it's really good to meet some interesting individuals from our profession. 
So moving on uh, to talk a little bit more about the Engineering Council UK spec. So as Greg mentioned earlier, it's this is the Engineering Council's uh, standard for professional engineering competence, uh, and it explains the requirements that people must meet uh, to become uh, registered engineering technicians or engineers at CNG or IENG levels. It sets out five broad areas of competence and uh, commitment uh, that you have to meet uh, to satisfy uh, the criteria for, for being registered at one of these grades. Uh, so the five areas it covers are knowledge and understanding, design development and solving engineering problems, responsibility, management and leadership, communication and interpersonal skills, and finally, there's the professional commitment. Uh, these are all detailed in the UK spec document, uh, and this document itself provides very useful examples of evidence, uh, and it gives a clear description as to what reviewers will assess you uh, within the individual competencies during your review. Uh, so I have an excerpt here from, uh, this is the knowledge and understanding competence uh, at chartered engineer level. So uh, within that, it gives a, a bit of a background of it. It gives a, an example of what the applicant is having to demonstrate. So effectively the criteria that I'd be assessing uh, as a reviewer uh, to make sure a candidate is actually uh, demonstrating. Uh, then most importantly, it's given examples of evidence that uh, a candidate would really want to be considering uh, to try and present within uh, the review uh, to demonstrate that they're actually meeting that competence. Uh, I wouldn't, I, I, I don't think I can overemphasise how important the UK spec is. Greg mentioned it in his introduction. It's really something that has to be uh, used throughout your uh, preparation for a review, just to uh, demonstrate, I think, to yourself, to your sponsors, and ultimately to your reviewers that you're meeting the requirements of the individual competencies within the UK spec. Uh, so as I say, it's essential that candidates are very familiar with the UK spec. Uh, a well-written portfolio of evidence will cover all areas of the UK spec and provide good examples to demonstrate competence. Uh, candidates really need to work closely with their mentor and sponsors to ensure they have sufficient evidence to meet the criteria of the UK spec. And uh, just to re confirm what Greg said earlier, uh, you can download the latest copy of the UK spec from the web address shown below. Moving on, uh, the portfolio of evidence, so the, the, the big body of work that you'll be preparing in advance of review. So your portfolio of evidence is assessed in conjunction with your performance at review uh, by your reviewers to determine whether you meet the required level of competence for professional recognition. Uh, nowadays, it's compiled using the CHT's online portal uh, and your portfolio will contain uh, most of the following. So a copy of your CVD, your academic record, uh, your UK spec evidence forms, and that's 500 words covering the five competencies we just discussed. Uh, it'll also cover your project so synopsis uh, for your interview presentation. Uh, that's roughly about one page or 500 words. It'll have a CPD record of your past two years, CPD experience, uh, and we're really looking to demonstrate a minimum of 25 hours per year uh, of CPD records. Uh, and it also include technical technical appendices to support the information provided in the portfolio. Uh, in terms of your portfolio and some of the kind of details of the uh, the contents of it, one thing I would like to say as a reviewer is I think that the importance of a CV is often overlooked by candidates. Uh, your CV itself actually allows uh, a candidate to provide details of a project where space is limited within the UK spec evidence forms. As I noted in the previous slide, your UK spec evidence forms limit you to 500 words. Uh, so that sometimes doesn't give you the opportunity to give full details of a project you've worked on, whereas a, a, a well-written CV can actually provide a lot of that evidence uh, just in a, another part of your portfolio and provides a more rounded kind of uh, interpretation of the candidate. So candidates should think carefully about how they can use their CV to demonstrate competencies, again, referring back to UK spec. Uh, they should 
and this is a personal preference, so I'm, I'm not suggesting that uh, you, you can't just use a company CV, but uh, as a, a reviewer, my preference would be that a candidate prepares a bespoke CV and provides uh, sufficient detail on uh, their project experience and the background of the projects. Moving on to appendices, uh, one very important uh, thing about appendices is that they should really be well relevant and concise. Uh, this end, uh, again from experience as a reviewer, uh, excerpts from a report as a part of an expended appendix are fine. Uh, submitting a full report as an appendix is not. Uh, what as a reviewer we're trying to get is uh, a demonstration that you've undertaken a task that might actually clearly demonstrate that you've uh, met the competence. So providing a full report is really just uh, it's just padding, really. If you can provide an excerpt that, that gives kind of suitable, <coughs> excuse me, information, uh, that, that's that's a perfect uh, way to do it. Drawings uh, provided within uh, your portfolio should be provided at an appropriate scale, and importantly, should be legible when submitted on the online portal. Uh, and with regards to the online portal, uh, Greg mentioned that there's a, a, a final PDF that gets submitted. Uh, as part of your portfolio that comes to your uh, reviewers. Now, the online portal, I believe, gives the uh, candidates the, the opportunity to view a draft of this final portfolio. So I would always encourage uh, any candidate to review this uh, draft of the PDF, including in particular the appendices, to make sure that everything's getting presented in an appropriate resolution so reviewers can see the detail uh, that you as a candidate are trying to put forward. Moving on to the UK spec uh, evidence forms, so these really do provide the key evidence to demonstrate the competence uh, of the UK spec. There is a 500 word limit uh, per competence. Uh, this is checked by reviewers. Uh, as a reviewer who's had a, a number of submissions that didn't have a word count on them, I, I'd make a plea for any candidate to actually just include a, a word count uh, within their submission. It certainly makes it easier for reviewers just to ensure that, uh, that the word count hasn't been exceeded. Uh, as I said before, the CV can be used to provide some background information relevant projects, and that saves in some of this kind of the, the limited word count uh, that you're using within the evidence forms to demonstrate your competence. A good portfolio will clearly map to the competencies and commitments described in the UK spec. And a good portfolio will also make uh, good use of relevant and concise appendices and refer to them throughout. Moving on to CPD records, uh, so that forms part of the overall submission as well. Uh, as I said, they cover the past two years prior to the review. Uh, they should uh, record what the CPD has covered and most importantly, what learning uh, was achieved by the candidate from the CPD. Uh, the CPD should include an appropriate amount of health and safety training and uh, for self-learning is permitted to be recorded uh, within the CPD register. I always feel that consideration should be given by the candidate to an appropriate number of hours allocated. Uh, and if the number of hours seems excessive, this is likely to be challenged by your reviewers. Uh, other items within your portfolio would include uh, an organogram of your company position uh, uh, well, within your company or even a project team if you're describing uh, your role within a, a larger project. Uh, you'd have a SWOT analysis, so your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities uh, and threats, analysis of your current position and role. Uh, you'd have a personal development plan which would cover the next two to three years. Uh, and also provide as, as your supporting statements from your two sponsors. Finally, there is copies of your academic qualifications, uh, and these are generally verified by a, a signature on a scanned copy from your sponsor. As I said, finally, apologies, there's one more. Uh, there is the, the inclusion of the one page project presentation summary, which leads me nicely on to your project presentation as well. So, Probably the most important point for your project is what project are you going to present. Uh, I would always encourage a, a candidate to choose their 
probably the, the project they're most proud of and the one that they feel would demonstrate the most areas of uh, the UK spec. It's possible it may not demonstrate all areas of the uh, competence in the UK spec, but as long as it provides the, the most uh, wide-ranging ones, that's uh, uh, it's probably the most suitable one to kind of do. Within your presentation, you want to provide a suitable background on your project. Uh, something you have to remember is that uh, your, pro your reviewers are probably coming to your uh, project presentation fairly fresh in it. They may not know the background of it. Uh, the project will be obviously very familiar to yourself, uh, but you should not, uh, as presenting a professional presentation, uh, assume that your reviewers have any uh, background knowledge other than what was presented in your projects and offices within your uh, portfolio. Your presentation will have a 15-minute duration. Uh, your reviewers will enforce that. Uh, generally, they will give you a nod if you're beginning to run out of time. Uh, in our modern uh, method of presenting, your reviewers are often given advance, uh, advance sight of your slides. Uh, so we can usually kind of gauge where you are within your presentation just by uh, uh, having advanced uh, sight of your slides. In terms of your slides, I would say that the perfect number of slides for a 15-minute presentation is 13 to 14 slides, just on the basis of uh, talking to kind of one minute to just over one minute uh, per slide. That's the, the appropriate way to, to fill it with uh, the right amount of content. Uh, as I kind of say, the, the likely way for your review to be undertaken, uh, we I would say the majority of the reviews, well, ever since the, the pandemic, uh, all the reviews I've undertaken have been uh, via Microsoft Teams. Uh, so I would encourage uh, anyone uh, who's putting themselves forward uh, for a review to be familiar with uh, that platform. Again, talking about your slides, uh, something I find very useful that candidates can provide on their slides is just it's a simple thing of a page number. Uh, following your project presentation, uh, your reviewers will uh, discuss your presentation, and it's often good to refer back to the presentation uh, just to talk to individual slides. Providing a, a page number on that is a very good way just to inform that discussion that makes it a, a good bit easier to, to have that uh, back and forth. Another thing I would say is, again, because we're now using uh, likely a PowerPoint presentation for uh, candidates to present their uh, present their presentation, as a reviewer, I prefer to kind of see somebody kind of read it out as uh, a, a presentation that they're presenting rather than reading a pre-written script. Uh, it comes across as a, a far more professional way to kind of do it. I think the final thing on your project presentation is just to try and relax as much as possible. Uh, as a reviewer and having undertaken, well, having also been through the review process myself, I know it is a it's a very nervy time, and it's a uh, it's it's something that you can really build up to. Uh, but something I think all candidates should try and bear in mind is that you know more about your project than your reviewers, so you're the person sitting there with the knowledge, and it, it's really your opportunity to get that knowledge and present your project and yourself uh, in a very professional manner, uh, and it's your chance to shine to do that, so uh, just something to bear in mind that way. So following your presentation, you will have your review interview itself. Uh, so, in terms of the, the process of that, there's approximately 15 minutes of questions regarding your project presentation. Uh, as I said earlier, it's useful to re uh, refer back to your presentation slides uh, to talk about any of the specific points raised. Following that, there'll be around about 30 minutes of questions just regarding your portfolio of evidence. Uh, my preference when discussing the portfolio of evidence is to talk through individual competencies uh, just as the, the, they come in the, the portfolio. I feel that gives a nice flowing discussion. Other reviewers may just uh, talk about the portfolio as a whole, but uh, there's a, a general just discussion on your portfolio. Uh, now, that discussion is really just there. It's to confirm the competence presented in the project presentation portfolio. So as a candidate, you really want to try and present uh, information 
in your project presentation and your portfolio uh, that shows that you're meeting these competencies. Now, the reviewers aren't asking questions they're after to try and trip you up in any kind of way. It's just really to have a conversation to show that there's, uh, it's not just knowledge on perhaps kind of one instance of kind of uh, carrying out uh, a specific example. Uh, and it's just to, to show up, uh, to get us to acknowledge that the, the candidate's got a, a clear demonstration of the competency and commitments within that UK spec. So in terms of uh, an interview discussion. Uh, as a reviewer, I always like to uh, get answers to questions that, that come with the background and action and results of any examples that a, a candidate's kind of given back. So it's always good to know what's, uh, what the situation was, what you did uh, to resolve it, and how it was resolved, what was the outcome of it. And any answer that goes like that is kind of fine. What I would kind of try it, try and encourage everyone to bear in mind uh, as candidates is to try and keep your answers fairly fairly brief and try to avoid uh, any kind of protracted kind of long answers uh, so try and keep answers very nice and concise uh, where possible uh, your interview will also include specific questions in health and safety and the cdm reg regulations you know, health and safety and cdm is a very important aspect obviously of or professional careers. Uh, there's a particular focus within the review process on health and safety and CDM regulations. And as a reviewer, it's uh, almost a mandatory part of our assessment of your competency uh, as to whether or not you, you can uh, answer health and safety or CDM uh, questions appropriately. Final point on the interview, uh, I always like to see the interview as being a, a dis discussion between professionals uh, and certainly not an interrogation. Uh, as a reviewer, it's my place to to try and find information from you. So I, sometimes I, I might repeat a question or I, I may ask a question kind of twice just to, to try and give a candidate the opportunity to uh, to elaborate on a response or to pick up on a particular aspect of something, but it, it should never feel like that we're trying to to trip people up uh, on any any particular points in a in a question and answer session. Uh, and I'll, I'll just repeat that kind of bit. It's a discussion between professionals. So uh, as reviewers, we are we're putting ourselves in the position to actually have a discussion between someone who wants to uh, be considered for a professional qualification uh, and. That's the way that I think the, the interviews are, are, are best uh, conducted. Uh, so to wrap up with just some final considerations and a summary. Uh, so uh, to to again beat the kind of mantra of the, the UK spec, it's essential that all candidates have a good knowledge and understanding of the UK spec and you tailor your portfolio and presentation to demonstrate it. Uh, Answer any questions during the interview by providing the background, action and result of any examples given. Uh, listen to your reviewers' questions closely and try not to provide any long, protracted answers. Uh, try and be prepared for uh, specific questions and discussion on health and safety topics. Uh, try to relax. And remember, you're the expert on the information that you're presenting. It's your lived experience, it's your professional experience, and you're here to sell yourself as a professional uh, to achieve the qualification. And good luck is probably the kind of final message I would have with it. Uh, and uh, hopefully, I might meet some of you in the future uh, doing professional reviews. Uh, so that's all from my part of the presentation, I'll now hand you on to Laurie, uh, who has recently undertaken, uh, well, she recently sat successfully her professional review. Uh, so, over to you, Laurie. Thanks, Gordon. Um... Okay, so yes, as uh, Gordon says, I'm chartered with the CIHT. Um, I'm just going to talk a bit about 
my route to chartership and some of the lessons I learned along the way and hopefully some of those can be useful to you whether or not you're sitting for chartership or you go a different route to me. Uh, so a little bit about my background. Um, so I said I got chartered last year. My route um, educational wise was quite easy because uh, I have an accredited master's degree with the Engineering Council. So that was quite simple for me. Prior to getting chartered, I had 16 years experience in the highways and infrastructure sectors. Um, so my specialism was four um, and back to the eight specialisms that Greg showed earlier with a variety of different clients. I actually joined the ICE when I graduated initially and completed my IPD with them because I was on a training agreement with my company at the time and that was the uh, route we went. However, by the time I had the space to think about getting sitting for my professional review, the work I was doing was far more aligned with CIHT, so that's how I ended up sitting with the CIHT instead. Um, so this doesn't touch on all the elements of um, your portfolio of evidence, but just some of the ones that I thought were more difficult for me. Um, the organogram was quite a simple thing to provide. Um, so I started collecting these together in 2019. However, the pandemic sort of interrupted my preparation. So it probably overall took about six to nine months to put my portfolio together. The CV was based on uh, one that I produced for work. However, as uh, Gordon said, I, I didn't um, use that template exactly. I did tweak it so that it was applic more applicable for the CIHT submission. I also had the basis of a professional development plan, which I worked on, so it was suitable for submission. And I had been keeping a CPD record since I graduated. Um, see that these are the um, things you need to record in your CPD record. I would highly recommend that everyone fills every box in as they go along. It's a lot easier than uh, going back to it later and having to elaborate on something which might have happened two years ago. The more interesting thing to complete for me was the SWOT analysis. Um, I did not have a SWOT analysis prior to sitting down to pulling together the portfolio. So I, did, I had to sit down and try and be really honest with myself about my strengths and weaknesses. I also um, sought feedback um, from other people to see what they thought my strengths and weaknesses were and where those might uh, lead to opportunities or threats. As um, both have said, uh, getting a mentor is, um, I thought was a really key thing for me. I didn't have an official mentor as such, um, but I did have two, um, two mentors, uh, one who's chartered with the CIHT and one who's chartered with the ICE, both provided um, valuable feedback. Um, so, I mean, hopefully you can find somebody who you work with, who, you, who knows you, who can really help you um, make the best of your knowledge but if not um, do ask around your company often if you work for one of the larger companies there'll be plenty of people around or um, as Greg said uh, go back to them. Most of my time was spent pulling together um, the portfolio the evidence for the competencies when I asked when I start a similar webinar to this and I asked the question you know, which schemes, how many schemes, and do they need to be your most recent schemes? I was told that, yes, they should be your most recent schemes, and ideally you'd use one or two. However, um, don't let this put you off if you don't have the perfect two schemes that cover all the competencies, because I ended up having to use five, although I, that was a challenge in itself. I started off with, with the evidence, um, by putting the competency headings at the top. So obviously I was um, specialism four, so doing the competencies relevant to specialism four. Um, so I've had the competency headings at the top to refer to, and then I bullet pointed out all the pieces of evidence that I wanted to touch on that I thought would demonstrate my competence in those areas before I then started to write it out in prose. I um, as very similar to what Gordon said, the situation, task, action, result is very similar to background, action, result. 
make sure when you're writing your evidence that you actually um, talk about what you've done that demonstrates the competence. I found it, I spent a lot of time explaining the project and I had to cut all that out later because uh, 500 words isn't actually that many. So when I went back through having written about 800 words for one of the competencies, I had to cut out all of the, a lot of the explanation and really focus in on what I'd done to demonstrate competencies. I also um, got my mentors to read what I'd written and just confirm back to me that actually what I'd written did um, convey what I thought it did. Um, they were able to point me out in a couple of locations where actually I hadn't really, although I had, I did demonstrate the competency in my working life, I hadn't, what I'd written did not demonstrate that. Uh, and lastly, on this, the evidence, I'd suggest starting at the beginning, because uh, I, I did actually start in the middle um, for some reason, and then I had to rewrite, I think I started on COD, and then I had to rewrite those when I went back, because they will appear in order in your final report. Um, here's some examples of evidence I used in my appendices. Um, as Gordon said, I used clips of things, so um, extracts of drawings which I annotated, referring back to points I'd made during in my competency evidence, um, as a site instruction, a clip of a program, a clip of a designer's risk assessment, and I referenced those back to my evidence so it was clear what each was demonstrating. I would strongly suggest if you get to the point of submitting that you don't leave it until the last day, give yourself a week to um, try and iron out any last issues. Um, and there are some special characters that the, the, um, the IT system for CIHG doesn't like. So do make sure you check the whole document, including your appendices for those and, and remove them before trying to submit. I had done that, but um, still had a few issues. So do ask CIHD for help, which uh, they had to give me the IT uh, support, had to give me some help to get mine over the line. Uh, don't just sit there and worry. Okay. So if you've submitted and it's been accepted as suitable, um, then you need to prepare for your professional review. Um, obviously this is all based on my work, but these are the slides I used. Um, you see there's, there's 14 con slides of content there, um, as, as Gordon said, but I thought that was about the right number for a 15 minute interview. I tried to concentrate on putting images in, not a lot of text, um, so I wasn't just reading from the screen. Uh, if you've got any videos embedded in your presentation, do check that the technology works. I mean, this is especially important if it is on Teams, um, which mine was, I I'm not sure if we've gone back to in person yet. Um, but yes, do check that the video works, will play, and if sound is important, that the sound also works. A colleague of mine had issues with that when he sent for his review. Um, I practiced uh, presenting this review until I no longer needed notes. Um, it wasn't a script as such that I was learning, just to make sure that I hit all the key points um, over the 14 slides. And I also had a mock review with my mentors and uh, my company also has some professional reviewers. Uh, so one of them sat in and helped me uh, sort of iron out any last issues with the presentation, but also get used to answering questions on the whole of my portfolio because um, all of the items we touched on, it wasn't just the presentation or the evidence. We did talk about my CV and the SWOT analysis and the professional development review. So they were all touched on in the interview. So do make sure you've, you give those due consideration. And also you make sure you go back and look at them before your review, because there can be quite a time gap between actually pressing submit on your final report and sitting the interview. Uh, on the day, dress for your interview. It, I, I know it helped me feel like I was in that professional mode, even if you might be sat in your living room. Um, do have a break beforehand. Don't try and go straight from a big work meeting straight into doing professional review. Try and have a 
a relaxed, calm yourself down so you're in the right headspace. And um, lastly, I one of my reviewers actually lost connection during my review. So don't panic if there's a technology fail. We, we're all used to it now. Um, just take a minute. Um, Greg will come back on the screen and sort it out, no doubt. Um, thanks very much. I think we're going to have some questions now. Yeah, if the rest of the panel wants to come back on screen, we've had a, a few questions come in and I would encourage um, all attendees, if you've got questions, to, to put them in the chest, uh, question box now, which you should have on the, the right hand side in your dashboard uh, type thing so that we can ask them to the panel. Um, so the first question is, why might the application be refused? I think that's about the sort of pre-interview assessment stage. What, when would an application not proceed to, to review? Uh, I, I let Gordon gather his thoughts, but a, an obvious example that I would um, suggest would be that if you're applying for CNG and perhaps you've only got two or three years of experience and it's very, very obvious to the reviewers that you don't possess the necessary experience. And in effect, it would almost be um, not in anyone's interest to go ahead with, with a 90 minute interview to explore um, your experience in any further detail. Um, that would be one of my suggestions. If it was kind of littered with grammatical errors, uh, spelling mistakes, if it looked like it had been very rushed, um, that could alert your reviewers to the fact that you perhaps didn't take a lot of time or care in preparing your application. Um, that would be my thoughts. Gordon, I don't know if you've got any further comments. Yeah, uh, all of the above there, Greg. Uh, obviously, as a, a reviewer, the, there is a process that we go through when, uh, when we're issued with the portfolios of the candidates that are potentially going forward to review. We do a, a, a pre-assessment stage, therefore we, we have a, a quick review of the, the portfolio just to make sure that it's covering all the areas that we'd expect it to. Uh, it, it's by no means a, a detailed review at that stage. Uh, that kind of comes on kind of closer towards your actual review. Uh, if we do a, a bit of a deep dive into your portfolio, but uh, there is a initial assessment where we'll have a uh, a light review of your uh, submission, and uh, if there's anything that we feels missing that would mean you you're not suitable to go forward for review, uh, we advise the the CHT Education Group at that point. Great, thank you both. Um, the next question is uh is it necessary to provide evidence for all of the objectives of the competencies yeah i can come in on that one greg if you want uh, the yeah, I think that means appendices maybe it, so in, in terms of the actual competencies uh we we do review uh all the kind of subsections of the the UK spec, so so we're looking we're looking to make sure that a candidate actually kind of demonstrates all of those. Uh, there are, sir, we we you can just, we define if they're satisfactory or unsatisfactory on the subsections of the the competencies, and then make an overall uh, assertion if if you're satisfactory on competency A, B, C, D, or E. Uh, so it is. Uh, I have undertaken reviews for a candidate that's maybe been unsatisfactory in one of the kind of subsections, but uh, on balance overall, uh, they are appropriate for it. What I would caveat that with is, though, if you're unsatisfactory in health and safety, uh, that's generally going to be a unsuccessful review. Uh, the importance of health and safety probably can't be overemphasised in that regard. I think. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the questions are coming in thick and fast now, which is good. Um, so the next one is sort of a, about the kind of level that you're working at. When it comes to selecting a project, how much technical input do you need to have had? Um, the person asking the question says um, at their stage in their career where they manage multiple projects, they don't have as much technical input as they might have had at an earlier stage. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I, again, I'm coming in that one. The, the technical kind of side of it is really covered by competence A and B. Uh, so within those ones, we're really looking for to provide a very kind of overview of it. Uh, it's really just looking at an application of technology to uh, to bring forward engineering solutions uh, and uh, how you actually kind of develop uh, engineering solutions uh, as, as part of project work. So we would be expecting somebody to demonstrate uh, experience of of some uh, uh, technical aspects of a job. And it's just ensuring that a candidate's got those examples that they can provide. Thank you. Um, also, sorry, I was going to come in on that one as well, because it's kind of applicable to my level as well. Having 16 years experience, I'm reasonably senior now. And um, so I don't do the everyday technical bits, but you still find yourself making decisions. Even if you are more senior up the tree, you're still making decisions about what's happening and guiding other people. So you can use those examples. Great, thank you. Um, a couple of people have asked whether experience needs to be UK based or can it be experience gained in other countries? Uh, yeah, I'll come in on that one. The, it's, it's overall experience. So it's, uh, you, you just, I would just refer back to the UK spec again, to be honest, you're, you're just demonstrating experience uh, as a professional that you've, you've worked on, uh, on projects that, uh, that show that you've you've got that understanding of the engineering profession uh, to to show that level of competence with it. So uh, personally, myself, I, I had some non-UK experience within my portfolio, and uh, again, it's as long as it's answering the uh, the requirements of the UK spec, uh, that's what you're being assessed against. So uh, overseas works uh, fine. Uh, I would be expect uh, if I was had a candidate with overseas experience, I'd, I'd probably expect to. Uh, uh, to ask a few kind of questions about how that would compare to UK standards as well, though. Yeah, we, we do have quite a few candidates now who are based outside of the UK and will use international experience. Um, the next question is, uh, will there be questions relating to climate change or net zero and what sort of things could a candidate be asked in, in those areas? Uh, yeah, I would I would say under commitment E, there's uh, or, uh, one of the the sub sections of that is under sustainability. So uh, yeah, it's it's obviously a a very uh, very much a forefront topic that one. So uh, certainly when I'm reviewing candidates, sustainability is playing a, a kind of key part to that. Uh, yeah, I, I would I would probably kind of say sustainability isn't always just about the climate change kind of side of it as well. It's 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 the the broader picture of materials and and, and such like. So uh, it's 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 certainly a a good discussion point. I feel during a, a lot of review interviews. Thank you. Um, a couple of people have asked about historic examples and and how far back you can go to sort of prove. The elements if you've you've got quite a lot of experience. Laurie, I think you touched on this on in your presentation. Yes, yeah, so as I said, I did use five um, um, jobs that I discussed, um, and one of them did go back five years, um, just because it had a crucial competence that I wanted to use it for. So five years was how far I went back. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I've had candidates with kind of probably similar kind of time skills. It, uh, sometimes when a candidate comes forward with a bit more experience, uh, some of their technical experience is going to be further back, just like Laurie said in our, our presentation. Uh, so the uh, I wouldn't say there's a statute of limitations on your technical experience, but uh, sometimes if if there is if there's technical experience from very far back, it's likely standards might have changed, codes might have changed, and the likes. So uh, I would I would like to think that any examples that are put forward are still kind of current in terms of their their technical uh, yeah their technical uh, information provided with it. Um, thank you. Um, so going so continuing on with with um 
historic work. Can you talk about a scheme you completed from a previous job if you don't have any drawings or evidence to support what you say? Uh, I'd, I'd probably put that back to the, the question. I'm just going to uh, think of if they'd be comfortable talking about that and if it's if they feel that that's a, a good example to really kind of to, to demonstrate their competence. It's I, I'd say the review process is about using the best kind of communication uh, formats we got available. So I'd probably consider that. I wouldn't preclude using that. It's maybe not the best example to be using if you've got another project where you have uh, better support and information available. But obviously, it is there is that understanding that you people do move between jobs and they may not have that information available uh, to to present. But uh, on the whole, though, I think if there was an example for you had supporting information, that's obviously going to be a uh, a better uh, example to present. Thank you. I know we're, we're getting near to the, the end of the slot, but um, I'll just try and ask a couple more, more questions. Um, how do you go about sharing evidence from um, projects where you've signed sort of non-disclosure agreements or there's other kind of confidentiality risks, uh, issues? How do you sort of deal with that in your portfolio of evidence? Uh, I, I have seen it. Uh, it's quite common for people to put in financial support and information when they're uh, presenting evidence for project management uh, capabilities. So uh, it may be a fee proposal or, or such like, but obviously there's confidential financial information in that. So uh, candidates are within the right to redact kind of sensitive information uh, from from any of the support and information with it. But again, I'd expect the candidate to to try and get that on balance with uh, what they're trying to present. If they're having to re retract too much information from it, they, they lose the overall effectiveness of what they're submitting. Uh, what's the point in submitting it? <laughs> so it's, it's maybe not the, the best of examples, but again, redactions are a way of kind of doing that so you can uh, deal with that uh, sensitive information. There were some things I had to redact and I just used a sort of blackout in, in yeah. my reports. Great, thank you. Um, if someone switches roles sort of through um, while they're preparing, um, do they have to sort of start over, or um, in terms of recording their CPD, or can they continue with their CPD record? Uh, for me, CPD is just a continuous record anyway. So uh, personally, I've, I've, I've worked for a few different employers in, in my career, and my CPD record is an ongoing kind of record of that, so it's uh, yeah, it's a it's just a continuing list to be honest. Uh, so there would be no need to restart that at all. I'd have thought. Um, and just one to uh, to finish off. Uh, what level in your career is the minimum to to qualify for the review? The level when you've met all the kind of criteria of the UK spec. <laughs> I don't know if that's a it's a deflective answer, but it's uh, everyone progresses at different rates in their careers. I would say uh, myself, I took uh, I graduated in two thousand and one, uh, so I was seven years uh, to come forward for professional review. Uh, other people, some people might do it in three, some people might do it in thirty. It's it's really down to the individual. Uh, if someone's motivated enough and they get the relevant experience, and uh, and I would I would say someone, all candidates should agree with their mentors and with other parties that they're kind of meeting that experience as well. Uh, so it's really to agree with your your mentors that you're kind of and your sponsors that you're meeting the requirements of the UK spec. But once you feel you've got that kind of level of experience, uh, I think that's the the prime kind of time to to do that so i, I wouldn't put a, a a time limit on it uh by any means but uh it's it's all about having that kind of level of experience within your uh, career um we've we've hit the end of our hour um there are still some questions to be answered so greg and i will respond to those 
afterwards most of them are sort of about um practicalities or they're quite specialist so we will sort of follow up with you if, if you've posted a question you haven't had it answered but i'll just hand back to greg to finish off yeah thank you kat and uh, thank you everyone for attending today uh special thanks to gordon and laurie for taking the time to speak with everyone today um just to let you know that this session has been recorded and should hopefully be available um, on our website to watch within the next week or two um, if you would like a copy of today's presentation slides um, please do contact us at the education email address and, and we're happy to forward those to you um, any questions um, that you might not have felt comfortable raising today again please just get in touch with us um, at education very happy to have that conversation with you Thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your week.